Now, there's a lot of places from which this variation actually comes from. Some of the variation comes from meiosis, from that recombination of genes within the population. And a lot of people which are against evolution actually make the argument that there are no new genes being mutated because the majority of mutations cause problems. So the chance of a mutation actually being beneficial is too low to account for all the different variations that you see in life. They think it's more like just recombination of looks that are already present to create new kinds of look. Now, it doesn't make any sense, though, but because we, we have data that the kinds of looks show up as the gradual changes in the environment actually take place that never showed up before. And these are based on genes that never exist before, based on molecular clocking. So it's, we know that mutations do take place. So along with meiosis, which will basically switch around the genes and create new combinations will cause new looks, which is why there are so many different kinds of humans in the world and everybody, nobody ever is going to look the same because between independent assortment, uh, crossing over, and then random fertilization, a lot of variations are going to be created within the population through sexual reproduction. But in addition to the variation created through sexual reproduction, you also have mutations, which is the source of new variation. So while sexual reproduction creates the combination of looks that already existed and not true evolution, mutations create new looks upon which variation can enter the, the, the population. Now this variation will be maintained throughout time for a lot of different reasons. One of the main reasons for that is diploidy. The fact that we have two sets of chromosomes makes it very hard for selection to ever delete a certain gene because we have two copies. So sometimes you're going to select you can't select against the gene because that gene is not even showing. So you can't select against it because it's being masked by the other one. So let's say, for example, the little a alu was disadvantageous or deleterious. But you have a big a alu at the same time. That means you're going to show that instead of the little, L, little a, which is maybe recessive. And then that means you're not going to necessarily be selected against. Likewise, selection doesn't select against a single gene. It selects against the combination of all traits. So sometimes... You're going to have multiple traits all working together uh, to create the final adaptation of the organism. So even though he may have one or two traits which are uh, bad, if he has more good traits than bad traits, he may just survive and then pass on the bad traits with him. And see, that's why some of the things which are not necessarily advantageous get preserved in the population because of that. You also have traits such as multifactorial traits, multiple genes to making each, each, each gene take place. So it's going to be very hard for selection to select against any one of those genes because it's really the effect of multiple genes which are making this happen. Likewise, when there's platropy, it's going to be hard for selection to select against platropy because there's, the, the gene makes many roles. So even if it's bad in one way, it may be good in many other ways. And so that's going to preserve the variety of the look. Sometimes the environment changes the way you look. It's going to be hard for selection to select against that because you may not even show the gene if the environment is not making you uh, see it. It's, it's, if the environment is deactivating the gene. Uh, you also going to have maintain variation through processes like epistasis where genes depend on each other and so you can't select against the gene because there's another gene that depends on that gene and so selection is going to be slowed down. So variation is maintained throughout time by things like that. So a really good example of what I'm talking about is the idea of balanced polymorphism. And like the word sounds, it's that happens when there's no advantage of being either the homozygous dominant or the heterozygous for the trait. Uh, sometimes uh, there's going to be a little slight more advantage of being homozygous dominant, but this is an example of when you're going to be advantageous to be heterozygous. In other words, it's advantageous to be a mixture of both or to have both, not necessarily going to be a mixture. But this will be especially the case in the cases where there's incomplete dominance, and this will actually create a hybrid look that will give an advantage over either of the homozygous looks. And most, in most cases, uh, there's actually going to be a slight advantage over the homozygous dominant, over the, over the recessive. But either way, the idea is you should tend to stay at a 50-50 ratio in the population in those cases if there's true, complete, balanced polymorphism. This is the idea that you're going to have in a population all the looks because the middle is being favored. And that's what we call also heterozygotic advantage. Because remember, we have two alleles for each trait, you know, and then we have 23 chromosomes, which have full of genes. Genes and we always get one from mom and one from dad. So for any given trait, we have two. So the diploidy is, is going to preserve looks even if there was an advantageous because you couldn't ever get rid of the little a because the big A, little a, which is the heterozygous, would preserve the little a in the population since you can't select against someone who's a heterozygous if the recessive is 
is going to be disadvantageous because the heterozygous doesn't show the recessive phenotype. It's masked. We talked about that idea, but this will take it a step further and actually talk about the fact that heterozygous is sometimes advantageous and it gives it an advantage, which leads to some polymorphism. The greatest example of this involves a disease called sickle cell anemia. Normal red blood cells look like this. They have a little depression in the center to increase surface area for diffusion. They're very efficient at carrying oxygen. They have a molecule called hemoglobin, which acts as a transport protein that will pick up that oxygen and transfer uh, all around the body between the red blood cells and the cells of the body that need them. And they will flow freely through the capillaries and all the little blood vessels that you have. But if you have a single substitution mutation in one of the genes that actually codes for hemoglobin, you will see that a single substitution on the second base of the amino acid sequence will change glutamine to valine somewhere in the middle of the, se of the sequence around the sixth amino acid. And that would cause a conformational change in the primary structure of the protein that would change the, the, the red blood cell or the hemoglobin to be completely abnormal. And these strange strands that form inside the cell will cause the cell to have what is called a sickle shape, you know. And then they will actually cause all sorts of problems. First, they won't be as efficient at carrying oxygen. They won't have the depressions that increase the surface area. They will also not be, uh, the homoglobin itself is not going to be as efficient at carrying the oxygen. And they can tend to actually stick together and block flow. It makes you actually harder for you to breathe. So all of it together, it's going to cause you know, oxygen depletion problems, and most people tend to die for that disease if there's no treatment. Now, if you're homozygous dominant for this disease, if you're homozygous dominant, that means that you're going to be fine. You're going to live a full happy life. Nothing's going to be, go wrong. Unless, of course, we're going to talk about something that was going to cause the heterozygous to have an advantage. If you are uh, homozygous recessive, you probably will have sickle cell and you will die of sickle cell disease before you actually have a short life because it's very, very bad. Now, modern medicine has made it easier for some people to live with it, but if you truly have sickle cell disease, it's a serious business because you're going to have less oxygen uh, transportation capabilities. Now, if you have sickle trait, and so this is what they call the heterozygous, you know, you don't really have sickle cell, but you're also not normal. You have a look that's kind of in between. It, it's actually, it's kind of like you're co-dominant. You're expressing both the defective homo, uh, hemoglobin and the abnormal hemoglobin. So some of your cells will be normal. Some of your cells will be defective. So you're, you have an intermediate functioning level. Now, the cool thing about having sickle trait is that you actually don't even notice that you have the disease because you don't have it. Uh, the ones which are normal, the, the, there will be enough in your body that they, they will carry through and they do the job that the red blood cell is supposed to do. So you won't have the actual syndrome that comes along with the sickle cell, which is having the respiratory problems and also the blood flow problems that are associated with it. So it's kind of like, you know, at the organism level, these two things form complete dominance. You're fine in this case, but in this case, you're going to actually... Um, you know, not be fine unless modern medicine can somehow help you. Now, at the actual chemical level, it seems like the person who has sickle trait has an in-between performance level, but that it's good enough to be okay at the organism level, but it's actually not as good as the normal. So it's kind of like an incomplete dominance. But if you actually look at the molecular level, it's really cold dominance because both uh, uh, of the proteins are being expressed, so you have cells of both types. Why am I even talking about this? I'm talking about this because malaria is another disease that affects red blood cells. This one is actually caused by a parasite that lives inside red blood cells and will actually replicate inside red blood cells and cause the red blood cells to lice and then they will go on to infect other red blood cells and repeat the process over and over again. So these malarias... Uh, infected cells were actually spread throughout the, the blood and these endoparasites would actually basically cause serious problems which will cause headaches, chills, sweating, dry cough, enlargement of the spleen, nausea, vomiting, pain, fatigue, very severe fevers. feels like a very bad cold but it's much more complex than that. You have severe blood problems in fact. Now the, the life cycle of malaria can be very complex but it actually does involve a mosquito and being bit by this mosquito is the mosquito that actually carries the malaria from person to person. So uh, that's how it gets transmitted across the population. Now the interesting thing about malaria and sickle cell when put together is that there's this interesting pattern. Look at that. Sickle cell is endemic to, to Africa. There's a lot of, of people among African-American populations or other populations that live, come from these areas in the U.S., for example. And in African populations, everybody that lives in these areas have a higher chance of actually having that sickle cell alley in the population.
Now, notice at the, in, the incidence of malaria. And it's a tropical disease which affects the majority of, the, of, of Africa. And then compare that to the sickle cell gene. Do you see a pattern forming here? It's almost as if wherever malaria was pro pr present, it seems that the sick sickle cell is more common. Now, if you learn anything about evolution, that means that that's, there's something about that look that's making that gene more common in the population where the malaria is present. Almost like selection is putting pressure towards the sickle cell gene whenever malaria is present. And the, the idea is that if you have sickle cell, of course you're going to die. So that's the problem. So if, you, so if you're going to be lit away, lit away, you're going to be in trouble and you're going to not make it, basically. But if you're big A, big A, you're, you might die from malaria. But if you're big A, little A, you're going to have an advantage. You see... Those, the fact that you have those some sickle cells makes it harder for you to actually contract malaria, and that actually makes you kind of almost immune to malaria. So that gives an advantage to people who are carriers of the sickle cell trait, uh, and therefore are going to be more likely to survive one of the diseases which is most endemic to that region. And so the heterozygote has an advantage. And that's what's going to call the balanced polymorphism that you see in Africa. So that's a great example of how genetic variation is preserved in a population through genetic mechanisms and the differential selection effects. So I hope you learned a lot about variation. And from here, we're going to talk a little bit more about how selection actually works. I'll see you guys then.